Hi everyone, welcome to Volcano Tuesdays. My name is Gina and I work as an educator with the Mount St. Helens Institute. I'm excited this week to teach about the science and stories of Mount St. Helens by helping us think about some of the plants and animals that make their home at the mountain. When the volcano erupted in the huge 1980 eruption, it had a dramatic effect on the landscape and on all of the plants and animals that live there. This week we're going to learn a little bit about those creatures and their roles in helping the plants and animals and other animals return as well to the mountain. To begin, we're going to look at some images that were taken from a satellite to think about what happened during the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. This was not the largest eruption in Mount St. Helens history, nor was it the smallest eruption, but it was a sizable eruption and it occurred when we were able to take photographs of it. It happened on a clear day and because of that, we understand a lot more about how volcanoes work because of when the eruption occurred. Because it occurred in 1980, it was a time when we didn't have digital cameras, but we did have film cameras and we were able to take pictures of the volcano erupting both from the ground and from the air. At that time, we also had satellites up in space. So let's flip over and take a look at a couple of those satellite images. This is an image that was taken before Mount St. Helens erupted. Now it may look confusing because the land looks red, but the red color is just the infrared light that's reflected from plants that are green. So everywhere that you see red, you can imagine that it's actually representing green plants. In the center of this image, we see a snowy cone peak. That is our volcano, that is Mount St. Helens. Now look at, there's lots of red equally on all sides of the volcano. If we flip over to a picture taken one year later in 1980, we see something very different. The red around the volcano is not even anymore, and there's a huge zone of gray where the mountain erupted into. We can see that when Mount St. Helens erupted, it had a dramatic impact on the landscape around it. But that impact was not even on all sides. Instead, it was asymmetrical. It blasted in one direction out to the north. In these pictures, north is represented at the top of the photograph. Now, don't get confused by the white on the left side. That is just clouds that were captured Remember, these are pictures taken by satellites that are circling the Earth and sometimes there's clouds overhead. If we flip to the next image taken just a couple years later, we see that the zone affected by the eruption, which we see as gray without the red colored plants, goes very far all the way following these river channels that flow from the volcano. In this picture, taken a couple years later in the 1980s, we see that some of the zone that was blasted, affected by that blast to the north, on the northwest side, there's some pink starting to grow back, representing plants starting to come back into the area affected by the blast. But still, just a couple years after the eruption, we, see, we can see the scar of this eruption from as far away as space. Let's remind ourselves what happened during the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. This video is created from a set of photographs. So notice how the side of the mountain is falling off in this picture. As the side of the mountain falls off, it uncorks the hot magma that had lots of gas underground and that explodes outward in what we call the blast. Then that hot material mixed with snow and ice already on the volcanoes flowing downstream into these large debris flows we call lahars. This is a picture of a lahar burying and carrying a bridge downstream on the north side of Mount St. Helens on the Toodle River. Here's a picture of another eruptive aspect that happens when the volcano releases that hot ash material down with gravity, we call these pyroclastic flows. This was what was purple on our map previously. Here's a picture of when the pyroclastic flow passes through, it leaves huge deposits of rocks that we call pumice. Pumice are light rocks full of air bubbles and pockets. And there's a picture of a person circled in red here that's actually lifting and holding up a piece of that pumice. 
when the blast cloud pushed through out of the volcano, it knocked down huge old trees like they were matchsticks. And you can see all of the trees blown down in this photograph. And finally, when we look at Mount St. Helens from space, as we started off with those earlier satellite images, we see that the whole north side of the volcano, in this picture, north is pointing down, there's a huge zone where the vegetation, the trees, no longer exist. They were all blown down and killed by the blast of the eruption. Here's a picture of Mount St. Helens before the eruption. So think about all of those animals that we just looked at. What types of animals and where might they be living? Before the eruption, there were deep forests surrounding the mountains. After the eruption, the forests were blown down. We see all these tree trunks on the ground, different trees and pieces of material debris that were all thrown from the volcano. Notice this picture is taken at the same place. There is no more forest and the shape of the lake has changed. Yet, now we are 40 years since the mountain erupted and a lot of plants have grown back. This is the first plant that was observed to grow very close to the mountain called a prairie lupin. And today we see that Mount St. Helens is covered with wildflowers and it's actually a very rich place for plants and animals to live and grow. What we're going to do today is we're going to learn about the various areas affected by the eruption and think about the animals that live there. To do so, I want to pull over in a short interview that was conducted with one of my friends, Katie May, to ask her about what she thinks about the eruption of 1980 and the types of animals that lived there. So let's flip over and watch Katie May. This is my good buddy and my daughter and Mount St. Helens Institute volunteer, Katie May. You've been to Mount St. Helens before, right? You like Mount St. Helens? That's pretty neat. There's a lot to learn, isn't there? What's your favorite animal up there? River otter. River otter? What do you think it was like for a river otter? Like what was their, what was their perspective of the eruption when it happened? Where do you think they were living? Water. In the water? What kind of water? Like a river lake. or a lake or something? Mm -hmm. What do you think they did when the mountain erupted? Dive underwater. They dove underwater. Do you think, uh, you think they could have survived the eruption? No. How, maybe not. It'd be tough, but you know, there's some lakes where fish survived under the ice. Mm -hmm. And so maybe if they were able to, you know, got through the eruption and the, and the fish were still there, they had something to eat afterwards. Maybe? Yeah. Way to go, Katie May. Thanks for being a special guest on Volcano Tuesdays. You spoke about river otters, and I'm going to show a quick slideshow of some of the animals that do live at Mount St. Helens. I'm going to show some of these animals and see if you can guess what they are. You can learn more about them by going to play our game that's on our website. All of these animals lived at Mount St. Helens before the mountain erupted, and all of them now currently live at Mount St. Helens after the eruption occurred. How quickly were these able, animals able to come back and make a new home in a totally new landscape? We're going to learn a little bit about that today. To learn about how the landscape was impacted by the 1980 eruption of the volcano, we're going to take another look at that satellite image. And we're going to think about how the different events that occurred during the eruption impacted the landscape differently. Now from the satellite image, it's not very clear what happened in different places. Some places were affected by the landslide, some places were affected by a blast, some places just received a lot of ash fall. We can see on this map that in some areas, there's places where the land is smoother and some places where things seem to be steeper. But really, all that is very clear is just the area, the entire area that was affected by the blast. If we come over to this map, this is a schematic map showing the different colors of the different zones affected by the eruption, and we can see that it is much more clear. So if we read the key, we'll see here that the lime green color shows the area that was affected by the lateral blast. It's called the blown down forest, where the blast that came out of the volcano was so powerful it blew down all of the trees like matchsticks. 
we can see on this map that that was a very large area and it covers almost entirely from east to west on the north side of the mountain. What we are going to do today is we are going to color in our own map of the eruption. So here is a map that takes, again, that satellite image and draws out those distinct zones. This is a color by number map. So if you look closely, you'll see in the different areas, there are different numbers, and those numbers correspond to the key at the bottom, which tells us which color to color it in. I did a drawing of a free form map based off of that map, and I'm going to color it in. You can color along with me or print the map on your own. Let's flip over to that drawing. So getting out our drawing supplies, we are going to start by drawing a legend or a key, which is going to be a square box in the corner of our drawing, where we're going to label what the different colors are as we go. Then I'm going to title my drawing, and I'm going to title this 1980 Eruption. Nice and big at the top. Also, my drawing is somewhat to scale, so I'm going to draw a scale bar on the bottom, and this is going to represent the distances between things on my drawing. The scale bar that I drew is a couple of inches long, and it represents a distance of five miles. We're going to start by drawing the volcano, and in this drawing, our volcano is going to be represented by that little circle. Coming off the volcano, I'm starting to draw all of the rivers and drainages that flow off the volcano. These river valleys were filled with mud and sediment that flowed downstream in the debris flows that we spoke about. Some of these debris flows went really far from the volcano, more than five miles, as you can see with our scale. I'm also going to draw on the west side a major river that the volcano, the rivers coming from Mount St. Helens flow into. This river is the Tootle River, and then I'm going to draw the Cowlitz River coming down, and eventually the Cowlitz River flows into a much larger river called the Columbia. I'm going to make that a wide and fat river in the corner of my drawing. Now I'm going to begin to go through the various stages of the 1980 eruption and draw on my map how those different aspects of the eruption left deposits on the landscape. The first thing that happened during the 1980 eruption was the landslide, where the top of the mountain fell off. That material flowed downstream, filling a big valley in front of the mountain on the north side. The deposits left by this landslide were over 600 feet thick. Then, on top of the landslide, came pyroclastic flows. These were hot flows of ash and pumice that flowed out of the volcano and left thick deposits over 100 feet thick in some places of pumice, that lightweight rock, right in front of the volcano on the north side. As I go, I'm going to put numbers in the different areas on my map to represent the type of deposit that's represented. So, number one is going to be the landslide. Number two is going to be the lateral blast. So, when the landslide uncorked the volcano, all of that material came out and blasted to the north. This material blasted as far as 17 miles, which is further than you and I could run in one day, likely. And so I'm drawing very far from my volcano, using my scale over 10 miles away, the area affected by the lateral blast. Lateral means sideways. I'm going to label this number two. On the edge of the lateral blast, where the blast was not traveling quite as fast, it was not powerful enough to knock down trees, and instead, the hot ash in the air just ran into the trees and burned all of the needles, singeing the needles and killing the trees, leaving a forest on the outskirts of the blast zone that we call the standing dead. I'm going to 
draw like a little bathtub ring around my blast zone, the singe zone. The next feature on my map are the pyroclastic flows that I mentioned earlier that happened right in the front and center of the volcano. I'm going to label those number three. Number four is going to be the debris flows, the mud flows that came down from the volcano. We call these lahars. And these traveled in all of the major river drainages on all sides of the volcano. So I'm labeling number four on many of the different rivers surrounding the mountain. Finally, number five is going to signify where we had new lakes forming because when the landslide came down, it dammed up creeks, creating new lakes. There are three new lakes on my drawing. I'm going to label the Columbia River. And then I'm going to begin to color in each of these different zones with a different color. So I'm going to start with orange as the color for the landslide. I'll color in a small bit of orange on my key. And I'll also maybe make a box around it to color it in. The orange on my map is going to represent where the landslide traveled. If we were to walk in front of Mount St. Helens today, we would find these distinct zones. Some zones where the landslide traveled, and some zones where the blast traveled, some zones where the mud flows traveled. I'm going to color the landslide deposit in orange. This is number one in my color by number map. The next deposit that I'm going to color in is the lateral blast. This is a huge, huge area, so it's going to take me a moment to color all of this in. The lateral blast traveled many hundreds of miles per hour and was incredibly hot. So for any animals or plants that were in the way of this blast, if they were not sheltered on the side of a ridge, or underwater or underground, they would have been killed by this blast. This blast traveled quickly. And when the blast happened, it created such a large sound that for anyone that was close to the volcano, within perhaps 50 miles, the sound waves did not reach them. The sound was so big that the sound blasted up into the stratosphere, hit, layers in our atmosphere and bounced back down at a radius much further away from the volcano from Mount St. Helens. And so for animals, plants, and people who were within the blast zone, they would have not have heard the large blast of the eruption. Perhaps they heard the many thousands and millions of trees that were knocked down and the sound of rock falling from the sky but that big blast was not heard. The blast, the sound from the blast, traveled all the way up to British Columbia and Canada. Yet for the people who were closest to Mount St. Helens, they did not hear that sound. I'm gonna to continue to color in the blast area green. Again, this is number two on my color by number map. The next element of the landscape that I'm going to draw is the pyroclastic flows. And these deposits occurred right in front of the volcano. This is number three on my drawing. I'm going to color this with a hot pink color because these were some of the hottest events that happened. Finally, the last element to my map is coloring in where the debris flows or the lahars went. I'm going to do this with a bright blue color. These debris flows started up on the flanks of the volcano and flowed down 
with gravity following the river channels and filling those river channels with mud and debris. Today, the riverbeds are still full of that mud and debris, and it's very clear when driving along these river valleys that something dramatic happened recently. The Lahar on the river to the north flowed all the way down until it hit the Cowlitz River and then down until it hit the Columbia River. I'm going to color all of this in. I'm also going to label the river. It's called the Tootle River, T-O-U-T-L-E. Finally, I'm going to color in the new lakes that were formed by the eruption. There were three lakes. One of them existed before the eruption, but it was changed dramatically by the eruption, so I like to think of it as a new lake. That lake was called Spirit Lake. The other two lakes are called Coldwater Lake and Castle Lake. Finally, I'm going to label on my key, add a note about the singe zone outside on the edge of the blast zone where the trees were not blown down but the needles were burned off. I'm going to color this in a dark green color. When Mount St. Helens collapsed in this landslide, it was like uncorking a soda bottle. Hot rocks, ash, gas, and steam exploded upward and outward across the landscape. The volcanic debris was strewn over 230 square miles and blew down millions of trees. And so in our map, we're doing a map of the different areas that were affected by the eruption and by that blast. To learn more about how the animals experienced those different aspects of the 1980 eruption, we're going to pull in the executive director of the Mount St. Helens Institute, Ray Yurkowitz, to hear his perspective on some animals that are special and important at Mount St. Helens. Hey there, I'm Ray Yurkowitz. I'm the executive director of the Mount St. Helens Institute. Happen to be part of Volcano Tuesday today. Uh, though I've been executive director for a number of years before that, I was a scientist and I did science at Mount St. Helens. I actually came Mount, to Mount St. Helens to study plants and animals on the Pumice Plain, which is in the heart of the blast zone. It's such a beautiful place between Mount St. Helens and Spirit Lake. And for my research, I got to study pocket gophers. You ever heard of a pocket gopher before? They're kind of like moles in that they live underground, but they're not moles. What's interesting is that they have, they're very cute little animals, and they have fur-lined pockets on the inside of their mouth where they stuff roots and plant parts that they can take back to their underground burrows where they live and then they, they can save them and eat them later. And they're also really neat because they do a lot of digging. They make mounds kind of like moles except for mole mounds are like a volcano with the hole in the top but pocket gopher mounds they come out and it's kind of like a fan shape. And the way they do it is they'll dig and they'll use their long claws to loosen the earth and then they'll go on the other side of what they dug and put their paws next to their face and use their face and their paws like a little bulldozer and they'll push the dirt out and they're very they're very uh, busy little creatures and so what I did I studied them I wanted to know what effect they had on the plants and the soil at Mount St. Helens they survived in parts of the blast zone further away from the volcano because where do they live underground, underground. so they were protected from the blast but closest in where you had the, the big landslide and you had the blast and the pyroclast, really hot pyroclastic flows uh, cover it up. They didn't survive there, but they came back. They recolonized. They crawled across the land. When plants started growing on the pumice plain, they were attracted back there uh, to all the, the luscious green plants that they liked to eat. And so they started digging out there and bringing up ash and other pumice to the surface. And so I was out there studying what they did. And it was really a lot of fun to be out there. Uh, checking out gophers and, and seeing what effect they had at Mount St. Helens because plants and animals are a really important part of how Mount St. Helens has changed since the eruption. 
Thank you so much for your input, Ray. It is so special to hear from you as someone who was able to work firsthand in the zone affected most extremely by the 1980 eruption. Pocket gophers are still abundant at Mount St. Helens today, so if you visit the mountain, you can look for their burrows on the ground if you're in the north on the north side of the mountain in the area affected by the blast. To learn more about the animals at Mount St. Helens, I'm going to demonstrate this game, the Game of Chance. This Game of Chance was created by some of our fantastic volunteers at the Mount St. Helens Institute. To play the game, you need to choose a number between 10 and 99. Any number that you choose will have two digits. There will be one number in the front and one number that follows it. The sample number that I'm going to pick is 33. I'm going to start by looking at the first digit or the first number. That first number three is going to tell me what animal I was during the time of the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. I'm going to flip to the screen and look for the number that I chose. I see number three says gopher. I'm going to click on gopher. That's going to bring me to a screen that tells me more information about the gopher. How did it survive? Did it survive the eruption? And I'm learning that gophers lived underground. Thank goodness I got to hear from Ray. I'm going to go back to my second number. The second number tells me where I was located. With this number, I'm going to go to our map and look for the number three on the map. When I find the three, I'm going to click on it and that's going to take me to this description about where I was located. Ooh, tough cookies. I was located really close to the volcano and I experienced a lot of pretty extreme events. I wonder if I would have survived as a pocket gopher. Finally, in this game, I'm going to be creative and imagine what it might have been like to be an animal living in that place. Might I have survived the eruption? If I did survive, what did I experience? Your challenge is to create something that reflects your own experience of the eruption. Perhaps you write a letter to a family member in another place, another gopher that's living on another mountain and say, you'll never believe what happens at this mountain. Whatever you do, send it to us if you would like to share and we can share it on future episodes of Volcano Tuesdays. Thank you for sharing your time and learning about Mount St. Helens with me this week. The Game of Chance game was developed by three particularly fantastic volunteers of the Mount St. Helens Institute, Katie Daniels, David Newcomb, and Louise Anderson. Thank you to you all for helping put this material together. Also want to thank our partners and sponsors, the U.S. Forest Service, the U.S. Geological Society. Many of the photographs and images that I show come from these partners and we're grateful that we have such a strong partnership with them. Finally, Tune in to Volcano Tuesdays to future episodes, but also share us your feedback and ideas on the forum on our website, mountsthelensinstitute.org. Thank you all so much. See you next week.